Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to our game developer webinar, Better Player Production, How AI-Driven Content Moderation is Improving Player Experiences in Among Us VR, sponsored by Modulate AI and broadcast by Informa. I'm Alyssa McAloon. I'm the publisher over at gamedeveloper.com, and I'll be your moderator today. That being said, we have just a few announcements before we begin. Today's webinar is designed to be interactive. Uh, you'll see a dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen that will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media, interact with today's content, and submit Q&A questions to be answered by our guests after the live broadcast. Um, the slides will, or sorry, during or after the live broadcast, uh, we can get them in both. Uh, the slides will advance automatically during the event. You will also download content resources via the resources widget you'll see on your screen as well. Toward the end of the webinar, we'll also ask you to complete our survey. So please take a minute to fill this out before you leave us today. Your feedback really provides us with valuable information that helps us improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems whatsoever, please click on the help widget found on the bottom of your screen. Um, so on to today's topic and today's guests. Uh, content moderation is vital for ensuring you grow and protect your game's community, but it's an ever-evolving challenge which can make it difficult for developers to manage without the right tools and information. Today's speakers will explore best practices for selecting the right content moderation tool for your players. They'll share insights into common implementation challenges and how to avoid them, and uncover philosophies and strategies for you to refine your content moderation practices for your growing audience. Taking us through these steps will be Mark Frumkin, the Director of Account Management at Modulate, Laura Norwick Hall, Senior Player Support Specialist at Shell Games, and Alexis Miller, the Director of Project Management at Shell Games. Sorry, Product Management. Uh, at Shell Games. Um, so that being said, Mark, I'll hand things off to you. Thanks so much, Alyssa, and thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Really excited to be having this discussion with Alexis and Laura. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mark Pumpkin. I'm the Director of Account Management at Modulate, where my team and I work with all of our different customers to make sure that Modulate's platform and our products are enabling studios to learn about what's happening in voice chat, empowering trust and safety teams to actually protect the players and in turn, also learning from the inspirational folks that are uh, kind of on the front lines, learning about their projects, their initiatives, and their successes as well. And so here with me, I've got two of those uh, inspirational folks as well. Want to give them a chance to introduce themselves with a uh, little bit more of a story. So Alexis, we'll start with you. I know product management is, is far reaching as a discipline. Uh, what do you do other than trust and safety at Shell Games? A lot of what I do is data related. So digging for data insights to make sure that we're making games and features that our players want. So that includes things like supporting play testing, conducting analysis of our sales data to see what's working, calculating ROI of big features. I also get to promote accessibility in our games uh, and work closely with marketing on go-to-market strategies. That sounds like you've got busy, busy weeks in your schedule, right? <laughs> Lots to do. <laughs> Lots to do. And Laura, I know that uh, the paths to player support are also varied and wide. How did you come into this role? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have been um, working on player support for a few years now. Prior to that, <clears throat> excuse me, prior to that, I was a, um, a producer with Shell Games for four years. And before that, I was a project manager on a project with which Shell Games was involved. Um, so you're absolutely right. Many different paths to, uh, to player support. Um, before starting player support uh, at, at Shell Games, we had inquiries um, and player support tickets that were sent to an e email alias, and uh, they were field fielded by a group of um, vice presidents, random project directors, engineers, marketing personnel, QA, you name it. Anyone who was knowledgeable or involved with one of our titles um, was receiving these. And so there was a lot of institutional knowledge, but um, not so much structure. And so as we grew as a studio, um, we found that that need, plus the needs of moderation, um, definitely catalyzed us forming player support. Excellent. Thanks so much for that breakdown. We're going to dive right into kind of uh, how you got to developing that player support team and the tools and technology uh, that, that it took to get you there. So let's get into that. So uh, Alexis, this first question that I have is for you. Um, Laura described a situation where it was kind of an all hands on deck uh, for dealing with player support tickets. Um, when did Shell Games begin to consider adding something about content moderation? Was it something about a specific tool like Toxmod that you were looking for? 
were there any unique factors that were specific to Among Us VR that influenced your search for the right tool as well? So initially, the development team built in a lot of what I would call kind of DIY moderation tools, meaning that the you know players could um, use to sort of moderate themselves. So things like muting other players, voting to kick other players. And we also plan to have age gating since this is a multiplayer game. Uh, we know that there's a wide range of ages and there's voice chat. Um, so, so that was all in the works pretty early on. Um, but kind of as we got closer to launch, which was, uh, so we launched the game in November, 2022. So kind of backing up to like the summer before we sort of like circled back and looked at our moderation tools and we were like, Ooh, like there's still kind of some sticky toxicity problems that we probably aren't handling well enough. Um, from our original plans. So it was then that I got brought in. Um, so I looked at, you know, doing basically discovering research, like what are other games doing? What's out there in the marketplace? And also defining specific problems that we are trying to solve. Because toxicity is a broad term, right? Moderation covers a lot of things. So kind of breaking it down into like harassment, grooming, cheating, um, offensive usernames, privacy, like all of these things can't all be addressed with the same tool or the same solution. So we really try to prioritize those and then identify like well, what solutions or features would address each of those problems. Um, I, I will share that some of the ideas that made it to the cutting room floor. Um, so we considered allowing voice chat in only in private sessions. Um, as opposed to, to public matches um, that ended up not happening. We considered um, you know, using like an official age verification tool um, that ended up not happening. Um, I, I will say kind of your second part of your question, like what specifically was unique with um, Among Us, obviously Among Us VR, we were uh, partnering with and working closely with Intersloth, the IP holder of the original Among Us, so that was a big part of this process too. And you know, they already had, we didn't need to convince them of content moderation being important, right? Like they knew, they understood, um, and they were on the same page as us at Shell Games that like this was the right thing to do. So um, you know, Intersloth already had a, a variety of tools um, like player reporting, code of conduct, um, that we certainly benefited from their, their experience and, and partnership on that. Um, and then, honestly, part of what brought us to find Toxmod was that we had heard about other VR developers using the tool, um, and it seemed pretty compelling. Excellent. Thanks for laying all of that out, Alexis. I especially uh, really value that you all started with giving your players right, the agency to do some moderation on their own, uh, and that's really important. It's also really important that you recognize that all of the burden of dealing with the many different types of uh, toxicity or disruptive behavior shouldn't fall all on the player's shoulders. And so finding uh, ways to use your partnerships, finding ways to use different solutions uh, to kind of improve that overall experience is something that's really important as well. When we talk specifically about content moderation, what were you looking for in that content moderation tool? It certainly can't cover the whole range of options, but is there something specific that stood out to you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, at that time that we were looking and probably now too, the the need for there to be a tool that handled voice chat was, was obviously uh, important, but honestly a little bit rare to find. And then experience in VR was another thing that we were interested in. Um, to make sure that things like proximity chat in VR and also just from a moderation standpoint, you know, being in VR can really feel more real and more intense. Um, and so, so, so those were two big things. Um, you know, I think at a high level, like we wanted a tool that was gonna be able to help our human moderators to prioritize because we knew that we were gonna have a human moderation team involved um, and that the volume was just going to be way too much. So having a tool to be able to kind of prioritize what to spend the time on. Um, as most teams face, like 
we had a full backlog, so we definitely wanted a tool that was going to be relatively easy to implement because we had a ton of other stuff that we were trying to, to do at the same time. And then I think a specific thing that um, I wasn't necessarily looking for, but then when I found it is probably arguably the most important is the ability to find a tool that you can customize to tailor to your, to your team and your game's needs. Um, so being able to kind of create weights for different categories um, and, and again, think about each game separately, right? So we're talking about Among Us, which is a game about murdering other characters and then voting to figure out who the murderer is. So like, you know, if we were, if we were just like, hey, you, here's this AI tool, like you've got to just use it as is, I kind of suspect that our success would not be uh, uh, super exciting. Um, so. That definitely makes sense, and I'm, uh, it's certainly so important to understand. And one of the things that we always find and, and talk to our uh, you know, prospect partners about as well is the difference in volume when it comes to player reports that they could expect to be receiving and proactive moderation reports as well. It's just there's so much activity that goes unreported for so many different reasons. And having a tool that gets you, uh, that allows you to get a handle on that, not only just doing something about it, but also even learning about what's going on uh, is something that's so important. And then when you're able to customize, that adds, you know, it's it's another necessary item for this as well. Every single game is different. Every single experience is different. All the communities are different. And so there needs to be a way to differentiate between those different games so that players will know what to expect. In the same vein as giving players an opportunity to know what to expect, in tandem with research into the tools, it's also so important, as you know, right, to consider the policies like code of conduct uh, or internal moderation policies as well that align with the moderation tool. So Laura, I want to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, how did you go about developing those content moderation policies and aligning them to what you found was, uh, was working for you in regards to the tooling? Well, we had a little bit of a cheat code in that we were creating a game that was already based on the 2D Among Us game. So um, there was a, a ton of value in us trying to aim for parity with their code of conduct. Um, we didn't want something that players were already very familiar with being vastly different in terms of what we expected from player behavior. So um, so we can't take full credit for that. They, um, in, in our partnership with Intersloth, it was really helpful to use that as a, a start. As Alexa said, we definitely, um, being voice chat in VR, it's it's a different beast. So, um, you know, we we really wanted to to get it right as much as possible. So uh, we talked to as many stakeholders as we could. And so this was internal and external. Um, we talked to studio leadership. We talked to the dev team. We talked to, um, we sourced opinions from the game community. We tried as much as we could to hear every perspective and um, try to formulate something that could best serve our players and our game um, because we want a positive gaming community. Um, so we also talked to other games that were doing similar types of moderation um, just, to, just to get their experience, because um, we were very new to this. Um, and so uh, finally, we wanted to make sure that we incorporated uh, the ethos of our organization as well. So once we once we considered all of those factors, um, we tried to pinpoint exactly what what can we tolerate? Because obviously, we're we're talking about a game, people are spending their valuable time, and they're looking to blow off some steam. So you might every so often hear something that might be less than squeaky clean. And that should be okay for a game that has a target audience of, of 16 and older. Um, you know, we, we obviously support younger players, but in, in quick chat. So, you know, where do you draw that line? Um, and so in considering all of that, we, we tried to come up with um, a model that was as fair to uh, as many players as possible um, across the board. And since then, we've just continued to iterate on it and modify and evolve our strategy based on what we hear and the feedback from our community um, and what we're seeing in the game. That's excellent. Thanks so much, Laura. And of course, you did so much research into figuring out what to be looking for, uh, how to make this work, and really finding that best fit. The next step, the next phase of that, of course, is implementing these different tools, implementing 
uh, putting into practice what you've researched and what you learned from all of these different stakeholders and for, for, from your community. So I want to move us into that topic as well here. Laura, another question for you. I want to ask, uh, when you were doing testing and then between testing and uh, live launching, can you tell us a little bit about some of the key findings that you saw uh, in that phase of the work? Sure, sure. Um, so you hit the nail on the head. Uh, basically, you can think about something and um, make the best plan. And man, it's it's always going to be different in reality when you start to experience it. Um, so we so we ran a beta um, when we had everything in place to start doing in-game moderation. We ran a beta, and um, you know we got really good results. We found that um, it was a small but reliable uh, group of beta testers, and um, we were generally seeing all categories of toxicity um, occurring at roughly the same rates. Um, and so we continued, as I said, like it's it's an always evolving process. Um, we continued to um, base our moderation strategies on what we saw in the beta. Um, then when we launched moderation um, with, with our patch five, uh, it was in April of last year, um, boy, were we surprised. <laughs> it turns out the beta testers were a little different than um, just the general population, um, we started seeing harsher, much more egregious toxicity in um, in the, the wider audience of the game. And so um, we quickly modified uh, some of the standards that we had set based on what we saw in the beta. Um, we found that some categories, uh, such as gender, sexual hate speech, and racial cultural hate speech, um, ended up pulling away uh, like much, much more um, toxicity in those categories uh, than we were seeing in um, other categories. So we definitely changed what how we had the model tuned. We definitely changed um, some of our, our moderation practices to draw harder lines so that we could make sure that um, there was no gray area in these in, in some of these utterances. So um, just continuing to to see what you're seeing, your game community is likely to keep evolving. And when you run a beta like that, there was a lot of value in it for us, um, but definitely take those findings with a grain of salt and know that it it might end up, your your beta community might be a little bit different than your wider community, for sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I just said, right, each community is different, each experience is different. Even a community, communities within the communities could be different as well. And so, especially what you said, Alexis, around having the tool that allows you to configure different settings and change things based on what you're seeing as your community evolves is so, so important. Laura, I, I wanna follow up on that. You've, you've tested the tool, you've implemented the tool, it's been running for a little while now. What kind of impact have you all seen so far? It's a positive impact <laughs> to, to make great. it as, as like, <laughs> succinct as I can. Um, we have seen it definitely positive impact from using this tool. Um, so in a very obvious sense, um, you're going to be implementing bans based on egregious behavior. And so your worst offenders, the people who were spewing toxicity into the game community um, with any type of regularity, they're going to be banned from the game. So um, right out of the gate, you're oftentimes, because we we moderate um, from a priority queue, meaning that like the, the worst um, infractions are reviewed first, we're pulling that toxicity out of the game. Um, and so there's been a drop off in the number of infractions um, that we're seeing from uh, from players of the game. So when we first launched, um, we found that around 7% of daily active users were incurring some type of potential infraction. Um, that is to say that we were receiving reports from ToxMod saying this person may have said something that could be could be toxic. We need um, someone to to take a look at this. Um, that has dropped in time to, at some points, as low as 2% of the daily active users incurring um, potentially toxic infractions. So that's a huge win. Um, additionally, when we look at the number of infractions that people are getting, most players are um, incurring one valid ban and then learning from it and not getting additional bans. So when you look at a chart of how many um, how many bans players are getting, it, it steps down. So like most, the most players who have received a ban have received one ban. And I think you can extrapolate from that, that there is an edification of the community that people are learning from um, there being a little bit of a punitive action after um, there's an infraction, they learn from it, say, I don't wanna do that again. Maybe they do 
um, review our code of conduct and um, and then make the community a better place. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We want we want people to come and play the game and have a good time. Um, and and I think that our moderation strategy is pushing everybody in in the right direction. Absolutely, that makes so much sense. And that's great impact that you all are seeing so far. I think a couple of highlights from what you said there are uh, really educating the community as well and being transparent about what practices you're doing, what practices uh, you're taking in terms of moderation and also what projects you're undergoing, whether or not something worked or didn't work uh, and how that how players can expect to see that play out as their, in their experience is so, so important. And that player behavior does change over time, right? You get what you put into it. So as you refine your moderation strategy, as you keep communicating with your players, as you make sure that your code of conduct is plastered everywhere that it could possibly be, uh, you we do also tend to see this kind of across uh, across the board with all of our different partners is that uh, player behavior does change and the amount of sessions with toxicity and the amount of players that are toxic does drop as well over time. So it's really exciting to, to learn about that. Laura, I wanna ask you as well, if you were to give some tips for game studio leaders uh, to keep in mind as they test and as they implement different content moderation tools, what would those be? Um, well, uh, right out of the gate, I would say it can be daunting. Um, it's not gonna be perfect right away and that's okay. Um, the, the good news is like it, it's, you're doing some good in, in this type of work. Um, and one thing I like to say a lot is I, I always like to try to make sure that the good is not the enemy of the perfect. We can't sit here and be like, oh gosh, but there's still toxicity in the game or we miss this, you know, this sort of problematic incident and oh man, that's a bummer. I think shifting your perspective around and knowing that you are eliminating some of the toxicity in the game, you're helping people to be kinder, gentler, friendlier gamers. Um, you're making your game a more welcoming place for people to be. I think that's all tremendously important. Um, and it's the work that's worth doing. So um, I think you need to be open to, um, like I said, constant iteration um, and an evolution of your moderation practices um, because you're gonna learn a lot from both doing it and from the feedback of your community. Um, and I think one other um, really important factor to all of that is communicating with everybody. Um, so uh, your development team, we've had some really productive, um, really helpful perspectives that have, that have come from our development team, from within our product department, marketing department, people who are um, talking with our community on Discord, um, you know, the players themselves in the gaming community. We do get a lot of folks who just submit feedback to us and we find that to be really valuable. Um, talking with studio leadership and having the conversations in hearings, um, people who agree with you, alternate um, perspectives, really considering them and making sure that like you're open to their feedback and you do a good job of communicating and explaining what you're doing with moderation, why you're doing these things with moderation, and um, and just trying to trying to get everybody on the same page with it because it can be multifaceted, um, it can be ever changing, and I do think that um, it not only builds trust within the team, but ultimately your your moderation practices in the end will be stronger for it. That's excellent. Those are great collection of tips. I'm really glad that a recording of this <laughs> will be available as well, so people can review that. One thing that stood out to me uh, that you just said, Laura, is not letting perfect be the enemy of great. Uh, and you mentioned right uh, in the impact that uh, it's dropped the number of players, the number of daily active users that have had uh, kind of toxic offenses has dropped to as low as 2%. And that matches with what we see across, uh, across the industry and across our different partnerships as well. There's a lot of offenders that are first time offenders. There's only a very small, small population um, that are kind of repeat offenders that log on to games in order to disrupt other players' experiences. For a vast majority of, uh, of players, right, they could be having a bad day, they could just get a little bit angry in a specific match that they've had, something might not work out, and giving them an opportunity to learn more about the expectations in the game as well through communicating with the studio is something that's really important to do and something that is part of, is just part of the game, right? It's just part of uh, how we're doing trust and safety. I want to move up to kind of a, a little bit of a higher higher level uh, aspect of this. Alexis, a question for you here. Content moderation is a really dynamic project for a studio. 
which is part of an even greater trust and safety initiative that has so many different moving pieces. Do you have any recommendations for studio leaders as they consider trust and safety as a whole and the different parts of it? Yeah, I think um, from the perspective of being new to it, don't hold on to your ideas too closely. You know, this kind of reinforces what Laura said, which is like, you start off, you kind of do your best, you make decisions, and then you learn later that you were wrong. So you have to kind of be okay with that um, and, and be flexible. Um, I think it was also important as we were going through the process to sort of go back and revisit our goals for doing it in the first place and our, our priority problems because there was just constant trade-offs and it was kind of overwhelming how many options there are where you're like, holy cow, so um, just, just kind of like taking a step back and revisiting those are important. Um, I also found that the trust and safety community is really wonderful, very welcoming um, and supportive. So wherever and however you can connect with that community, I would recommend that. Um, and, 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 and don't be afraid to ask uh, tough or seemingly stupid questions um, because it is pretty complex stuff. Um, and so, Sometimes there are things that are really difficult to talk about, but they really need to be uh, talked about. Definitely, that's great advice. And I wanna call out, right, you, you both mentioned this in both of the topics that we've discussed, right? Finding the best fit and implementing and, and kind of getting, uh, seeing some wins as well. Talking to others, talking to the community, your players, talking to the trust and safety community. There's so many people out there and our goal is the same improve the player experience when they connect with other people online. And so there's a huge support system and a support network that many of our organizations are a part of as well, not to mention tons of other organizations across the industry too. So there's a lot of resources out there and talking to your peers, talking to anybody else in the community can really help you focus down what it is that you're looking for, learn from those experiences, and then start implementing and uh, testing and doing all of that. Alexis, you also mentioned not holding on to those ideas too tightly uh, and being open to refining the process and testing again, which brings us uh, very, very nicely to our next topic here, which is test, refine, and test again. So Laura, I have a, an opening question for you here. In addition to all of the testing processes and going live, can you tell us a little bit about some of the ongoing processes that you've developed to stay on top of the player's needs? Absolutely. Um, and before I do that, I would love to caveat it with every game will be different. Um, and every studio, every, you know, the size of your game, the size of your dev team, what what your live ops um, look like. So um, while this has worked for us, like it, it might, your mileage may vary. It might work for you. You might want to augment it. It might not work at all. And that's okay, too. Um, there's no right or wrong with any of this. Um, Except for, <laughs> except for the fact that um, clear communication between all stakeholders is a must. I, I really firmly believe in that. Um, uh, what we are doing right now is we have a, a Slack channel open with the dev team all the time. If we get any any tricky kind of questions or um, issues that that crop up in in any regard, um, we have a direct line and and they have some um, allocation within the team to to help us address issues that that crop up. So that has been super helpful. Um, we have a weekly live ops triage um, where uh, I can discuss player trends that we're seeing um, in moderation or new bugs or um, any number of things that, that are coming our way um, just to keep the, the dev team abreast of what's going on with the player community, um, both with incoming troubleshooting requests as well as like what are the, what are the trends that we're seeing with, um, with moderation as well. Are, are we seeing one category all of a sudden blow up? Um, in terms of toxicity, is there anything we need to keep an eye on? Is there anything that we even need to think about in terms of like feature requests for the roadmap? Um, if there's something in the game that we could potentially modify player behavior with um, in a way outside of moderation as well. So those weekly meetings are super helpful to have that open line of communication and a bespoke time in which um, player support and the dev team can, can really get together and just make sure that we are staying ahead of the curve with everything. Um, and additionally, in, in those meetings, um, it's helpful because the dev team can let me know exactly what's coming down the pike, um, things that, again, features or 
um, new releases or anything that might that might augment player behavior um, and things that we can keep an eye out for too. So um, again, a lot of it comes back to that clear communication, but some of our favorite constructs have been um, an open Slack channel, um, regular regularly occurring meetings with studio leadership, as well as a weekly meeting with the dev team. Excellent. Definitely a lot of work to kind of keep that uh, keep that testing and refining process open, and it just makes it it just highlights the importance of having a tool that's not only configurable but also a tool that gives you the data that you need in order to make data backed and data informed decisions, uh, and that's a really big part of uh, kind of uh, in general transparency in this industry, but also transparency when it comes to the kinds of projects that we work on too. Alexis, a question for you here. I want to talk about kind of evolution. Uh, and your uh, your take on Shell's approach to player support changing or staying the same in the coming months and years? Anything that we can expect to see? Uh, I'd say overall, um, staying the same, but then I'm like laughing at myself because of course it's going to change. Um, I, I know that kind of in the coming months, one of the big changes is using more automation for the worst offenses. And so, you know, essentially what that means is we're in the tool, everything gets a score. And so we're able to say the very, very highest scores, which translates to like pretty nasty stuff um, that we're able to automate that. And the reason we're able to do that is because we've been having humans reviewing all of the AI flags for, um, I guess it's been close to a year, honestly, before we moved into automation. So we felt pretty darn confident at the threshold and that, you know, automation was going to be beneficial for us. So we're still in the early stages of that. Um, but, but that, that's a big change uh, for us kind of going in that direction from the player side, the impacts that that have has is also that it increases the volume of data that we can process um, compared to before when a human reviewed all the, the you know, flagged data that they could in their, their day. Um, so that means that the bans happen faster. So you know, when a human was reviewing it, it could be days. And um, now we're talking about like minutes. So um, again, we're like early stages in that. So I think that's going to have uh, a, a big impact on our ability to scale, um, as well as, again, hopefully having a, a more positive player experience. Um, I, I will say, sort of to, to answer your question, if I could wave a magic wand of like how things change in the future, um, there's a few things that I would wish for. One is, you know, I'd love if we could utilize platform level player safety features more often, um, something like blocking, which right now we only have on one of our four platforms on PlayStation. Um, like personally, I love that idea of platform level safety because it you know sets expectation for players across games. So you're not trying to like figure out well what do we do in our game. Um, but right now, like it's pretty tricky because if your game is cross platform, which ours is on four platforms: Meta, Steam, PlayStation, and Pico. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty tricky right now. So I hope that, you know, maybe in the coming months and years, we can um, take advantage of some of that stuff. Another thing, if I could wave my magic wand, um, I'd love for us to be able to get our arms around providing a, a safe experience and environment for players of all ages. Um, Cause there's, you know, currently, I think a lot of games experience this, you know, there's friction between different age groups of people. Um, and so that leads to, you know, screaming, <laughs> harassment, other forms of toxicity. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to kind of exclude people from playing, but um, it would be really great if we could kind of find a, a good solution to to help people to um, to find the experiences that they really feel comfortable in. Um, we did implement a, a kind of cool feature to try to help with that where players are um, observing the game before they join a match. So you can, in theory, kind of get a feel for like, do I want to play with these people before you're you know, sort of officially committed to that game? Um, so that was definitely a creative step in that direction. 
Um, but that is something that I hope, again, in like the coming months or years that um, there might be some more progress there. Excellent. Yeah, that's a lot of a lot of cool changes planned. And uh, I think it, again, highlights the importance of being flexible, right? Not only in the tools that you've implemented, but also being flexible in the decisions that you're going to make. There's so many different ways to affect and to change the player experience, uh, whether it's you know nudging players with a notification here or there to be more pro-social, uh, or whether it's you know implementing transparency across your different moderation policies to let players know why an action was taken against them as well, or if it's just you know different game design features like the really cool feature that you put out where folks can observe uh, kind of a session before they jump in to see if. Uh, this is something that they do want to participate in. That's a really great idea. Uh, and so just highlights again the the need and the benefit of being flexible, of getting all of this different data uh, and making sure that you're able to make decisions about that as well. So we've kind of talked a little bit about finding the right fit. We've talked about implementing and seeing some of those wins, experiencing some of those challenges. Uh, and then finally, what it takes to test, refine, and test again. I want to move a little bit away from uh, you know, the topic of moderation and just ask you both, what are you, what are you excited about when it comes to the future of Among Us VR and the player experience in the game? And Laura, I'll start with posing this question to you. Sure, absolutely. Let me frame my answer in both the short term and the long term. Um, I think in the short term, um, some of the, the points that I've already mentioned, things like um, continuing to evolve our, our practices and learn more, um, that's obviously something that is never going to stop. Um, and uh, just continuing to leverage some of the efficiencies um, that we're now, again, now that we've been doing this for 10, 11 months, something like that, um, that we have learned enough and we've trained the model enough and we've built the tools enough that um, we can start to uh, leverage some of those greater efficiencies. So um, Alexis had mentioned um, automation. So we're, we're super excited that now that we've put in so much fine tuning and um, work, you know, there's, there's so much talk about AI and um, everybody has different opinions on, um, you know, what the implementation of AI, like the best implementation of it and the most appropriate implementation of it could be. Um, in my opinion, this is am an amazing use of AI. We're taking um, toxic behavior. We are helping people to modify that toxic behavior. And um, by adding automation into this workflow, um, we are keeping, we're protecting our agents, our moderators from having to hear some of some of the most unsettling, some of the most um, horrific utterances, things that we, at this point, because again, we've been training the model and training the tools and working with it for long enough, we can, um, we can say with a high degree of confidence, like, this is pretty toxic. We're pretty sure this is toxic. We can automate this and then review anything um, downstream from it. That's a huge win. Um, that's the, the type of stuff that is great for, for humans to not have to worry about quite as much. Um, and then longer term, uh, things that I'm excited about um, and possibly even beyond the moderation that we're doing within Among Us VR, um, just looking to develop more standards um, and resources for, for future games. Um, and so like we're applying what we've learned to um, an expanded suite of actions. So um, I've talked a lot about uh, banning players um, because of the timing um, in which we added moderation into Among Us VR, we were a little bit limited in um, in what actions we were able to take with, with players. The, just basically what could our game support? What infrastructure do we already have built into the game? And so um, again, making the, the good, not the, min the enemy of the perfect, um, we are able to ban, but we don't have necessarily as many moderation tools um, at our disposal at our disposal as other games do. Um, so things like, um, like temporary mutes, temporary bans, like um, shadow muting, shadow banning, all that strike kind of stuff. Um, warnings would be great. Um, I would be very excited knowing what we know now for a future game um, to be able to implement those and start talking about moderation earlier in the process. Um, I think that could be really exciting because again, we're really, we're not trying to punish people. We're trying to help the game community be a cleaner place and help people learn um, to be um, kinder gamers. So um, if we can do that with gentler tools, that would be amazing. Um, and that ties into your point too, Mark. Um, 
very long-term goal would be like an AI-assisted positive reinforcement. Where can we, instead of trying to, to suss out negativity and toxicity in the game, where can we identify positivity and then reward that behavior? That's awesome. There's so many incredible things to be excited for there, Laura. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to kind of digging in together with you on how we can support you all in doing that and learning from you as well as you go through these different projects and initiatives uh, and see what happens with the, with the player experience as you make these changes for the better. Alexis, the same question is being posed to you now. What are you most excited about when it comes to the future of Among Us VR and the player experience? Yeah, definitely some of the same stuff that Laura said. Um, right now, you know, we're we're just using bands. So you're banned for, you know, a day, three days, seven days, um, or a permanent ban in rare cases. And so that's really our only method of um, you know, kind of implementing moderation. And so we we've talked about it in the past and and I think going forward. Um, we might have some more options for, for other things like warnings or like I love the idea of the positive uh, spin on it too. So so that that's something that I'm I'm definitely interested in. Um, also, we're trying to do a better job of just communicating what we're doing. So we have plans to create a web page that is is like a parent's guide or overall player safety that's going to really outline everything. So those. DIY in-game tools like Mute and Kick, as well as explaining ToxMod tool um, and you know what's experience like for younger players, things like that. Um, so I'm excited to, to be able to more publicly share that information and make it easier for players and parents to understand what the experience is going to be like. I'd say unrelated to player safety, I'm, I'm also just excited about some of the things that our team is doing this year that's new. So um, we just introduced uh, about two weeks ago, limited time events. And um, that's been a really fun way to kind of show off the team's creativity and give a unique experience to, to players. So I'm excited for us to, to continue to do new things there to excite and, and engage our audience. That's excellent. Thanks so much, Alexis. I know from my perspective, we've been working together for quite some time and just thinking about you know where we were a year ago compared to now, so many things have changed. So exciting. The you know uh, the wins that you shared, Laura, are so uh, kind of inspiring and motivational and kind of pushing us to to keep going on this. I'm really excited to in another year look back at where we were now and see all of the very, very uh, cool new things that have happened in that last year as well. I know we're going to keep innovating, uh, and you all are going to keep kind of communicating with your community and being transparent, getting that feedback. Uh, and overall, I think it's going to leave us in an excellent place uh, moving forward when it comes to trust and safety, but also when it comes to just the players of Among Us VR having such a great experience. That's about it for the topics that we wanted to cover today. Uh, again, as a reminder, we talked a little bit about finding the best fit, assessing what you need from a content moderation tool, what it takes to implement something like that, and some of the challenges that you might experience, as well as some of the wins that you could expect to see. And finally, the importance of testing, refining, testing again, refining some more, and how that becomes part of a continuous process as you're driving to give the players the best possible experience as well. We do have a lot of time now here for questions from the audience as well, so I'm going to hand it back to Alyssa for help with that. Hello. Uh, we did have some questions come in throughout, so we will get to those in just a second. But I do want to remind everyone, as we go to the question and answer portion of our event, uh, you can type your question into the text box located to the left of the presentation window, or you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have anything you want to squeeze into the time we have left here. Um, if we're not able to answer all submitted questions during today's live broadcast, um, we'll share them with our speakers who can reply to you offline, and we'll be sharing resources at the end for you to find out more about them as well. So uh, kicking things off here, open question, anyone who wants to jump in, uh, do you have any recommendations for how to persuade studio leaders that content moderation is very necessary? 
I could jump in on this one. persuasive about you. Yeah. Okay. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Sure. Um, Well, I I do think that um, it's important to acknowledge that advocating for moderation, um, it can be a challenge regardless of who you're talking to. Um, So if you're talking about um, studio leadership, for example, um, it can be difficult to to make a case for it um, immediately impacting the bottom line. Um, This isn't necessarily something that will uh, directly immediately drive sales. However, having a safer gaming community certainly will help with player retention. Um, It will help with uh, your game's reputation. Do people, when they take a look at, for example, storefront reviews, if they're trying to decide whether or not they wanna buy the game, um, definitely that is something that will show up in the storefront reviews. So you wanna be very aware of um, just what what your online perception is of the game. Um, and it will bleed through to that. If you're talking about um, persuading not beyond studio leaders, um, you know, sometimes players themselves don't wanna be moderated. Um, so there's, there's definitely been some pushback that we've received when we first announced that we were going to um, start moderating the game. So, you know, studio leaders were very aware of that as well. Um, I'm happy to say that that pushback and that concern um, was was very short lived, um, and that it's it has ge- generally gone pretty smoothly since then. Um, and uh, some of the statistics that I mentioned earlier were where about seven percent of our daily active users were in bands at the beginning of moderation, and we've seen that regularly drop to I mean as low as two percent, but usually between two and five percent. Um, that is some hard evidence that shows that there is less toxicity in the game. Um, so, you know, if if you are truly turning into it in, in such a way that you want to um, to reduce the toxicity in your game, and especially some of the very worst instances, if you want to have a good um, chance at stopping some of the most egregious behavior, um, definitely there's an argument to be made there for for moderation. So, um, it runs the gamut from from we just want to make this a friendlier game to we want to be aware of something very serious could could be bubbling up through our game as well. Sir, do you have anything to add on that as well? The only thing that I would add to that is uh, you may find it a little bit easier to talk to studio leadership about this stuff and, and the things that Laura just mentioned, because many regulations that are uh, kind of already live and coming online soon, including the DSA, uh, require studios and large platforms to uh, transparently report what it is that they're seeing, not only to regulatory bodies, but also to their communities in the form of transparency reports, which you may have seen from companies like Xbox or Discord. Uh, and so those are becoming much more important and having an understanding of what's going on in your community, and what's going on in your game is the only way in order to kind of meet those requirements as well. Uh, and so that's another kind of angle to consider when you're talking to leadership about the necessity of uh, knowing what's happening in voice chat and having the tools that let you do that. I think we might have covered this a little bit as well, but it's kind of a similar uh, question here. So if same question, but if you're not in the position to decide to implement moderation tech, uh, how do you build that case? Kind of if you are someone who may, this might not be your direct role, but you're like, hey, the game could really benefit from that. How do you kind of approach that from outside of the normal channels, I suppose? Yeah, I can I can jump in on that one. Um, I think two, two big pieces of that are, um, one is as much as possible, giving some examples to prove that there is a problem. Um, it seems obvious, I think, to those of us that are working in this field already. Um, but, but you know, also when you're a game dev, like you just have certain expectations and you know things that might be acceptable to you, um, but but certainly are not acceptable to, to other players. So um, I think that's one piece of it. And then the other is um, looking at what potential solutions are. Um, So I've often found that one way to get people to kind of pay attention and start building that case is to find out what your competitors are doing. Um, It can be pretty compelling, honestly, especially if you can see benefits from what they've implemented. Um, And then another specific thing that uh, certainly was compelling for us as well is you know, looking at your current player reviews, or if you do have sources of being able to 
to actually listen to what's going on in the game. Um, but like we saw in player reviews and support tickets, some pretty nasty stories that were examples of players who have been harmed by toxicity. So, you know, again, kind of bringing that human element, I think is really important and powerful, um, whether it's from the players themselves or maybe parents, if it's younger players, it makes it a little bit harder to turn a blind eye and be like, well, yeah, like there's toxicity, but it's not that bad. Um, so those, those are two things that I think are pretty, pretty doable. Um, and then, you know, you can talk to other people in the company and be like, Hey, have we, you know, have we considered moderation tools? Like this is what I'm seeing and hearing and here's some potential solutions. That's good to know. Cause I think even if uh, toxicity or, like, isn't that bad, like it's still bad for somebody, somebody's having a really bad day because of it and we have to protect the players. So I understand that a hundred percent. Um, kind of on a similar route, um, Laura, I think you said earlier that we're not here to punish people. We're here to help people be more kind, gentle gamers, um, which I really liked. I like that approach to content moderation. So in a similar way, when you go to a player community and you implement a punishment, um, we had a couple questions come in. Do you give warnings before banning? Do you ban them completely from everything? Like, how do you kind of balance that um, when it's coming in to make sure that you're punishing someone in a way that feels like it matches what happened, but you're not turning them off of the game or you're not kind of just punishing them for the sake of punishing them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so as I mentioned earlier, we're a little bit limited um, because we we brought moderation um, into our game development a little bit later in the process than I think, it, you know, in retrospect, we ideally would have. Um, so we found ourselves um, with banning as our tool. That's our primary tool. Um, we this is one of the reasons that we didn't jump right into automation. We wanted to make sure that we are definitely evaluating um, everything that's coming our way and making sure that we're, we're being as fair and consistent with the players as possible. Um, to that end, we do allow players to appeal their bans, um, any ban that lasts um, more than three days, which is more of the serious categories. Um, you know, if it's, if it's just generally a few un unkind words, you might get a one day infraction um, from a ban that's, that's determined to be valid. Um, but say, for example, we're talking about like a week long ban. Um, so categories such as um, racial, cultural hate speech. Um, that's one of our bigger categories um, or gender, sexual hate speech. That's that's another top one. Um, basically, we we allow people to appeal the bans if there we can go back in um, and and take a look at what other players were saying in the game around the same time. Um, so, for example, we've gotten a few ban appeals who um, from people who said, I didn't say that word. Another player said that word. I was repeating what they said, or, you know, it, it's, it can be circumstantial. We take a closer look beyond just the utterance and um, really try to um, evaluate, like, is there any chance that this, that this player wasn't necessarily being toxic? Um, one, uh, one phrase that I find myself saying a lot, like when in doubt, throw it out. So if there's any question that um, actually uh, just yesterday, I was, I was um, moderating some, um, some clips from the game and someone said something that kind of sounded like a slur, but then the more times I listened to it, it sounded like he was just maybe kind of making some noises with his mouth. And I'm like, Oh, I can't be sure about this. So we ended up revoking that ban. Um, you know, it was something that absolutely sounded like a slur at, at first glance, but we definitely want to do our due diligence and being fair with the players um, to the, to the point of, do we do more than bans? I wish we did. I wish we did. Again, the good is not the enemy of the perfect. In a perfect world, we would have um, more functionality. And I think, you know, it's something we can consider for the future and certainly development of, of future games. We, we would definitely love to have that um, online. And it's something that Toxamon offers too. But again, our, our game just unfortunately didn't have the hooks in it for it. So um, right now we do leave a lot up to the bands, but um, that's where our player support team is there to, um, to help with ban appeals, communicate directly with players um, about what might be um, collected and, and definitely always open to reevaluating any of that evidence. I lost my mute button for a second. You'd think it doesn't move around, but I lose it every time. <laughs> no, I think that's a wonderful perspective to share as well. And I think it does bring up a, another question that we had come in from the audience here that I will send directly to Mark. Um, do these content moderation tools recognize potential false positives? At what point does a person need to step in to review those false reports? And we kind of got a preview of that, so we'll jump right in. Yeah, that's a great question and uh, something that's extremely important to consider. Um, 
that's one of the things that we at Modulate do when we're first starting to work with our customers, uh, when we're just onboarding them, is we always advise them to uh, first engage manually with the reports that Toxmon is escalating. It's really important to understand whether or not you are being shown the things that are violations of your code of conduct or your policies as well, uh, or if there's some setting changes or configurations that need to happen before uh, before you actually go live with taking action uh, on players. And so there's always a period of time initially where we work together with uh, our partners in order to refine what Toxmon is escalating, what the machine learning models are, are showing, because no machine learning model is going to be perfect. There's always going to be a chance of false positives, even when we're talking about really severe toxicity. Um, as Laura mentioned, right, sometimes you just can't tell if someone is actually saying this or if they're you know, just making a noise that unfortunately sounds like this as well. So understanding your, uh, you know, your kind of strategy for enforcement, uh, whether or not it's bans, whether it's you know, levying warnings or mutes or something like that, that can change your appetite for false positives depending on uh, the effect on the player's experience there. And so especially after that initial phase of manual moderation when you get comfortable with the different confidence at different thresholds. Uh, even if you are using automation, we always do recommend taking some time in order to validate whether or not you're still being shown uh, the things that are against the code of conduct or code of conduct violations, even after you've done that initial amount of, uh, of, kind of manual moderation as well. It's a really iterative process, right? Going back to testing, refining, testing again, and the goal is that you're able to use not only Toxmod's features, but you're able to use different features of uh, of your process and your games as well, your game community as well, in order to make the best decisions, not just one time, but over and over again and involve those decisions as well. Beautiful here. Kind of like a human approach, even in with AI involved, where it's very uh, curated for the community and for your specific needs and making sure everything is good there. So I'd love to hear that as well. Um, I think kind of, oh, uh, sorry, my scroll bar uh, jumped on me here. I do want to ask, there was one question that came in way earlier about uh, regions and kind of how you handle content moderation when your game is out in different countries, different regions, kind of people who might have cultural differences with the jokes that they tell um, or the words that are used. Sorry, I'm trying to find my exact question here. There we go. Are there differences in content moderation for different regions or countries where the game launched and how do you cope with that challenge? It's, it's a really good question. Um, I would say, to be honest, in our situation, we aren't looking at really any background information about players when we're um, listening to that audio. So we actually don't know what country they're from um, or what you know kind of backgrounds they might have. Um, but it, it is it's something that when the human moderators are listening to the audio, you know, again, you have the context of that game, and that's kind of it. Um, so it is a really interesting question. I, I'd love actually to dig in and, and see the answer to that myself. But the information that we have, we, we don't know um, what country players are from. I will also add that currently we're only moderating in English, which, again, is certainly a limitation. We know we have players around the world who do not speak English. But it was just a limitation of, you know, it, if we use, for example, like Toxma does support some other languages. So if we turned on Spanish, we, we didn't really have the staff that spoke Spanish fluently enough to be able to manage that. Um, so, so that has been a limitation. Again, maybe an area that we can kind of grow and do better in the future. Just glanced at the clock. Uh, time flew by for this uh, <laughs> with all the good discussion hand happening at the very end here, too. Um, so kind of on that note, uh, there were a couple questions that came through for just resources that people can look at to know more about moderation practices, best practices, what they should watch for, to know, learn more about what you guys are doing, what you've discussed, how, um, everything there. Big question, um, where can people go to find out more along this topic and to find out more about the work you guys are doing and your tool? Sure, I can start there, cool. if that's okay. Oh, sorry, Alex. Oh yeah, I was gonna. No, I was gonna toss it to you. So. Sure thing. 
happy to do that. So there's a couple of different resources. Uh, of course, uh, doing your own research and taking a look into uh, what your peers are doing is really important, as Alexis uh, mentioned. Some of the different resources that I would recommend is uh, taking a look at the Trust and Safety Professional Association. So that's uh, a not just gaming industry group for trust and safety professionals as well, where folks can discuss uh, their different initiatives and projects as well. And of course, I also want to mention that Modulate has a monthly newsletter that we send out called Trust and Safety Lately that you can uh, subscribe to on our website to uh, totally non-biased opinion here. It's one of the best newsletters that I've seen so far, just in the breadth of content that it covers, but also uh, in, the, in the ability to kind of convey that information uh, really briefly as well and allow you to do some digging on your own too. Uh, so that's a applause to our marketing team, of course. Uh, and that's a really great newsletter that I would recommend taking a look at as well. So uh, that's going to bring us exactly to time. And I'm going to go a little bit over to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, those of you in the audience, we really appreciate you joining us. And those of you on our lovely speaker panel today, we loved listening to what you were talking about and going through the ins and outs of content moderation needs, uh, which is a complex topic on its own. Um, so thank you, Mark, Laura, and Alexis for uh, your time and expertise on the topic. Um, I just want to toss it to you guys real quick. Uh, we'll start with Mark, and then we'll go to Laura and Alexis. Um, if folks want to know, learn more about Modulate for you, Mark, where should they go? I hear there's a good newsletter you just uh, talked about a little bit, but where else should they find out more about what you guys are doing? Uh, our website is a great place to start. Modulate.ai is a great place to start to dig into what we do and also the different resources that are available. Great. Uh, Laura and Alexis, I don't know if the same or different things you want to point people to for what Among Us VR has in the works right now and what Shell Games is doing, but where should people reach out to you at? Sure. Yeah, um, uh, definitely uh, check us out on, on Discord, shellgames.com, and our social media channels. Um, and uh, if you're having any player support or troubleshooting issues, um, feel free to reach out. I will probably be the person <laughs> you're corresponding with. Yeah, I would just add um, for folks that are interested in that, you know, that last question about resources. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, I'd be happy to to chat with you um, and and share some some specific ideas and maybe pointers uh, in addition to the ones that Mark shared. Sounds great. All right, uh, thanks to everyone at Modulate. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to read through here, uh, and thank you to our audience. So audience members, within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Uh, please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who might not have been able to watch live to watch that on-demand link later down the road, or have a real -list listen yourself to go over what we talked about today. Uh, the webinar itself, copyright by Informa, while the presentation materials and discussion materials are owned or copyrighted by Game Developer or Modulate. And the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests today, uh, I'm Alyssa Macklin. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lauren Alexis.